that we have was on democratic socialism in the United States. And it was by an insider, a, Demo a Democrat from California who was talking to us. Uh, uh, so uh, today we have the honor of uh, having Dr. Schwader talking to us about critical religion, which is, which is a, a really interesting development. And Dr. Schwader has been instrumental in, uh, in promoting this kind of study. Uh, the ultimate objective is to bring people together from all, all nations, all uh, different regions of the world on a common platform of critical inquiries and studies. Thank you very much for being here because I have not seen you before. I, I wanted to, I was really curious and wanted to ask you. So it's, it's really honor, it's really honor because I think there is a dis disconnect here in the methodology. That is very interesting. Like it to be part of the group. Thank you. Thank you. I think you are muted. We don't hear you. <laughs> Did me? Okay, I think somebody muted me. The the people in charge, the the, the tech technical personnel. But yeah, I can. I think I'm audible now. Dr. Klassen, could you kindly uh, switch on your camera and uh, uh, could I talk to you for uh, introduce you? Dr. Yep. Klassen was a keynote speaker. He's from the University of uh, Arizona mm -hmm. and uh, uh, a longtime professor of medievalistic. Mm -hmm. And he, he's from Germany as well. So uh, I would really be interested to hear uh, from him, from his, uh, his com comments on, on Dr. Schwaderer's uh, talk and her her uh, uh, research and mm -hmm. uh, kind of work she's doing with her colleagues in Erfurt. Yeah, so thank Dr. you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, Professor Klassen is also interested in poetry across the world. And so it's, it's, it's an honor to have him as well. Professor mm -hmm. Baker, would you like to say a few words to us before we start? We have two to three minutes, really. <clears throat> Well, it would help if you unmute yourself. There unmute. we go. Looks yeah. like the technology folks muted me too. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. let me begin by saying how, what a wonderful honor it is to see everyone again uh, from the conference and uh, some new faces as well. Um, I'm in Taiwan today. Um, I, I work between here and Vietnam, um, depending on which time of the year it is. I'm a, a research fellow there and a professor here. Um, I do a little bit of inter interdisciplinary work, um, which I really do enjoy. And um, I have the wonderful honor of participating with this journal. And um, I, I do enjoy reading and uh, helping edit and review and those sort of things. And I'm really looking forward to today's talk. And I want to thank, uh, thank you for coming to give it today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for being here for, and uh, uh, please be with us for the next one hour. We, uh, we would like to hear from you. Uh, looking and, forward to that. Yes. Thank you. I see, I see Professor Ernest Kadochnikov. Uh, I haven't seen you before. And uh, may you say just a few words informally before we begin? I'm, uh, I'm just a member of staff of the uh, University of Erfurt, Department of Religious uh, uh, Science, and I, I'm uh, uh, I I represent self-appointed <laughs> the staff to cheer up uh, Dr. Schwader. Uh, I, I have a, the honor to work uh, in the same floor. So, uh, yes, and I myself I'm working on, uh, on a different topic. I, um, comparing some aspects of uh, of the um, charismatic leadership uh, uh, in the Hasidic Judaism and uh, 
the Eton Orthodox Church. So it's, it's completely different. Topic. But I'm uh, very happy to be here at this conference. Thank you. I have a little comment, uh, kind of a serendipitous. Just yesterday, I sent off an article about probably the most important intellectual from your university in your, your city, Alford. Meister Eckhart. You, of course, know him. Yes, of course. And, uh, what an amazing person. That is really kind of an interesting link amongst the discipline. I mean, some of you might not know this 14th, early 14th century uh, intellectual, theologian, philosopher, mystic, but um, his interpretation or his visions of the realm of the divine, his explorations of the soul, have been uh, widely, actually globally recognized. And he is often compared now actually with uh, the teachings by Buddha, although he knew nothing about Buddha and Buddhism, but the kind of spiritual insights he gained are really just absolutely stunning. And um, so just to build a further bridges to you, Dr. Schwader, of course, mystics were often very deeply involved with music and tried to express um, their visions uh, through musical terms. So just to build some global connections to see how we all can connect very well. Thank you. Yes, excellent. I, I also see Dr. Priyanka Tripathi from the IIT Kanpur. Uh, could you switch on your camera for a moment and just uh, say uh, hello to everyone because you are an important member of our team and um, I would really love to introduce you to, to the speakers here and the participants. Dr. Priyanka Tripathi. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. So Dr. Priyanka Tripathi is, of course, one of our uh, board members, and, uh, and she is uh, one of the co-organizers of the, of the conference event that we have, the annual conference. Um, and that, as well, of course, uh, uh, we will be shortly introduced by Dr. Swam Prabha. And uh, if there is anyone, Tarun, you can think of, uh, or you can see here, uh, just to say hello to Dr. Shwadira. Uh, I'm looking forward to this talk, uh, Dr. Yes. Shwadira. Yes. Uh, Thin Nair, Thin Nair. Uh, I have Noel Mara uh, Chila uh, from Philippines. Uh, Noel, would you please introduce yourself to our chief editor and the audience? Uh, hello, good evening here from the Philippines. It's uh, around 11 in the evening here already. It's actually my first time to join. Uh, uh, conference you know, um, sponsored by your institution, sponsored by your organization. And uh, I'm really pleased to uh, be one of the participants this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. We have also Rajiv Bhushan. Uh, he is a specialist on language studies. Hello, uh, Professor Bhushan. Would you introduce yourself to us? He was also participants of our first IOC. Hello, Professor Bhushan. Well, I think uh, we are at okay. It's, okay. Uh, we are uh, crossing eight thirty, so we can uh, start our program. Uh, yes. So, Sam Prabhaji, we are waiting for you to start the program. Thank you so much and a very happy evening uh, uh, to all of you out here. So this time of the time is evening in India. So, and a good day for all of you. Uh, so I'm really pleased to have everyone uh, of us over here. And I, uh, like uh, I 
uh, I welcome you all to this uh, second uh, talks, impact talks of Roop Katha. And I take this uh, opportunity to introduce myself as I'm Dr. Swayam Prabha Satpati from Orissa, a temple city in India. And uh, I wish to see sometimes in an international conference, uh, all of you people uh, where you can, uh, we can again uh, meet and uh, have a knowledge exchange. So uh, I take this opportunity uh, to, uh, you know, you, we know that uh, Roop Katha is a Scopus Index journal, and it is uh, uh, it has a rank of uh, 64. Uh, I'm sorry, it is yes, 64 in uh, the worldwide and uh, 13 in Asia. So it's uh, definitely a privilege for all of us to be here. And uh, so uh, I think uh, before we go on board uh, with uh, Professor Isabella Schwadrer, so I take this opportunity to introduce her uh, by not wasting much time because all of us are looking forward to hear from her. And uh, so she uh, who holds her PhD in religious studies, that is uh, Orthodox Christian, uh, Christianity to be specific from the University of Expert. Her research interests cross between history, anthropology, and aesthetics. In her study on the work of uh, Stelios Ramphus, she examines Greek orthodoxy as a resistance against, but also a tool of uh, Europeanization in Greece. She has published in the field of religion and gender, religious interactions in the Mediterranean area, and Islam in Algeria. She is uh, in conversation with uh, Professor Titha Prasad Mukhapadhyay, uh, who is a very big name, and he doesn't need uh, much of formal uh, introduction because he's the chief editor of Roop Katha Journals. And uh, at the same time, he works, uh, he is uh, in the University of, a professor in the University of Mexico, uh, a professor uh, tutelier uh, at the University of uh, Mexico. And uh, so uh, I think we can uh, start with this. And of course, uh, we have Tarun, uh, co-founder and co-editor uh, who works with uh, Tita Prasad Mukhabadhyay. And uh, he also doesn't need uh, much of an introduction, uh, though he is working as a assistant professor in uh, university uh, at West Bengal. And uh, he's been into a lot of research. And of course, Roop Katha defines itself uh, with all its perspectives. So uh, I think we can uh, start with the conversation. Thank you, Tita. Over to you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Prabha. So I welcome Dr. Isabella Schwaderer. And uh, we want to really wanted to begin our session today uh, in a more informal manner and gradually picking up as we move forward on the very interesting, very important issues and critical religion and orientalist studies in Germany and especially Germany and uh, the German uh, perception of Indian culture with which uh, Dr. Schwader is uh, currently involved. So I wish to extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Schwader, first of all. How are you, Dr. Schwader? Thank you very much. And I'm happy that I had a little bit time to, um, yeah, to get used to the idea to have this huge public. And I'm really, I'm feeling really flattered that you are all taking your time to come here and to listen to me. And I really hope you will also pose some questions so that we can have a nice talk. Um, I say warm hello, or should I rather say it's a, quite cold hello from Germany, where I'm sitting. I'm sitting in Weimar, which is in the center of Germany. And today in the morning, I literally uh, moved heaps of snow from <laughs> in front of my house. So I was um, um, sweeping the entrance and yeah, it was really impressive. So um, I'm trying to imagine you in all the places of the earth and I just wanted to share with you this idea of heaps of snow <laughs> where I'm sitting. And okay. I'm very grateful for you to have, yeah, for having me. Thank you very much. So I'm looking forward to your questions and yeah. 
uh, yeah, I, I wish to begin in, uh, you know, with a conversation, keep it rolling as a conversation, and then we will have uh, questions coming in after about uh, half an hour or 40 minutes. But it is important for us to know uh, about you, yourself, uh, Dr. Schwadera. Uh, please, please tell us about your studies. So you seem to have uh, studied uh, religion and the classical languages. So could you tell us a little bit about your exposure to the classical languages and uh, religion uh, in your early career? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's difficult where to start um, because um, yeah, I started my studies with philosophy and classical languages, which in Germany means ancient Greek and Latin, and which is my first um, formation, let's say. And um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I never um, lost interest in, in learning new things. So actually I have um, dived into very different fields. And um, right now I'm teaching in a department of theology where I'm teaching religious study. This is at the University of Kiel, which is at the Baltic Sea in uh, Northern Germany. So I have quite some different um, yeah, I took some turns <laughs> in my career. So, and I'm, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. And maybe this might also explain why my interests are a little bit spread all over. And yeah, yeah I'm happy to be in a circle of persons who um, can appreciate this. <laughs> Thank you. But, uh, uh, what about your studies? Uh of the Greek language. I mean, I, I know that you, you are fluent in uh, modern Greek and you can also read uh, the classics in Greek. And so uh, I was just wondering what uh, you seem to learn or how did uh, your uh, learning of the Greek language and the Greek classics uh, influence you and uh, what did you think about uh, the Greek philosophy and uh, religious systems? Mm, thank you very much. This is a really difficult question, but I will try to answer it um, yeah, from a very personal view. So, um, so when I actually, I started studying ancient Greek also um, already at school, but this never really captured me. It was part of the curriculum. And um, so I continued that at the university, but I, what, what really hooked me was my visit to um, contemporary Greece, where I also spent one year of studies, which gave me a totally different picture and make me think about um, the way how um, Greek, Greek literature and um, philosophy are taught actually in not only in Germany but generally in Europe and this maybe is also a bridge to our later part of the conversation when I talk about orientalism then um, in there is a tendency or at least when I studied 25 years ago ancient Greek to leave contemporary Greece completely aside. So when I came back from Greece, back to my university in Germany, my professors used to blame me for the errors that I made in writing Greek because they said, you, um, you stayed for too much time in modern Greece because you make all the <laughs> mistakes that modern Greek students make. So I was a little bit perplexed about this statement. And um, I think it gives a quite a good view on um, the idea how German yeah, intellectual or a certain branch of um, German philology and philosophy was still clinging very much to the 19th century and to colonial ideas. So um, 
when we studied classical literature, um, it was about um, appropriating a culture which was um, allegedly ours or our ancestors uh, by completely leaving aside the contemporary Greeks. So, and this was one of the points that made me really um, try to look elsewhere. And um, so I, I, I finally, I stopped my, my learnings on classical Greek, mainly for that reason I turned um, to medieval and modern Greek studies more to, to get an idea of, of what was going on actually in this academical discussion. Uh, but in, in your somewhat later research and publications, you also seem to talk about uh, the Greek Orthodox Church. Mm. And uh, I mean, we here in India and the East are not very familiar with the history of contemporary Greece, although uh, Greece was always very important for the imperial project. You know, it, it occupied a key position and all the imperial powers, the European powers were trying to, you know, capture Greece. And Greece was, but before that, Greece was under Turkish occupation. And so the Greeks were trying to respond to Turkish occupation and, and uh, gain their independence from the Ottoman Empire. And then in, in the later history, the Greeks were fighting imperialism and uh, uh, the Greek Orthodox religion seemed to have given them a sense of identity as, as well. Uh, uh, so uh, was, it was it Greek nationalism or how, how would you explain that phase of uh, Greek uh, history to us? Yeah, thank you very much. I think you already said most of the important things that can be said about this. So I don't, I'm really wondering what I can add. Yeah, in fact, this was one of the main points which I have studied in my PhD thesis is, was the, actually this interconnection of, um, or the perceived interconnection of um, Greek national identity and um, Orthodox Christianity, which is also very complex because, uh, um, yeah, I'm, um, I feel a little bit intimidated because my colleague here, Ernest Kadochnikov, is here, who is, um, um, who has a very deep formation in Orthodox Christianity. So um, bear with me if I'm, you know, <laughs> abbreviating it a little bit. So um, the Orthodox, let's say. Um, um, mm, space yeah it's it's huge so we, we count between this uh, mostly contemporary russia but also parts large parts of eastern europe and greece is only one very small part but the greeks have um since the language in which the holy scriptures were um, translated or formulated uh, in the beginning of the um, formation of the church so Greeks still um, tend to, um, yeah, to incorporate or to claim for them the whole um, Orthodox Christian world, which is not unproblematic and there are a lot of tensions. Um, but from a Western European point of view, this is all very far away and probably in Western Europe, this whole issue is, um, even less uh, present than in India, I suppose. So um, Germany has always looked westwards, at least as the, after the Second World War. And so this is a field which um, is looked as rather um, small, yeah, even if it touches um, a lot of international connections, which are, um, which are related to imperialism in general and also in yeah the, the cold cold war and etc is also a big issue yeah so let uh, me stop okay. here maybe. <laughs> yeah a very a very simple question so the so in the 20th century 
uh, the Greeks uh, were looking at the Orthodox Christian religion, the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, were they looking at the Greek Orthodox Church as, uh, as an unifying influence for the Greek, uh, for the new Greek modern, for modern Greece? Mm, yeah, the, uh, maybe the question sounds simple, but the answer is not. So I would say yes and no. So um, as you can imagine, also the Greek nation, um, which is, a, a, I would say, a belated nation because it was allegedly founded in 1832, but actually um, until they became the size which is Greece now, uh, it took until 1947. And um, so this means that um, many things had to be settled in, inside um, the Greek society itself. And there is, yes, the idea that um, the Christian uh, culture is a very basic element of um, contemporary Greece. But on the other side, there's also this very strong branch of Philhellenism, which is turned towards classical antiquity more. And they kind of, yeah, they sometimes they are contending, sometimes they try to um, find one, um, let's say, more interconnected approach. So it's, it depends also on the personal and also on the political surroundings. Excellent. So, uh, you know, maybe I was trying to straight jacket that question of uh, Greece, Greek nationalism and uh, Greek orthodoxy together in a simplistic manner. So, but uh, what interests me here, as I read something, started reading something about your, car uh, your career, is that uh, in some way this experience, your experience in Greece, may have uh, created for you uh, an opportunity also to look at Germany and German, the history of Germany in the last two centuries the emergence of German nationalism and the role played by religion in uh, Germany. Uh, <clears throat> so I was intrigued and by the, the title of your work, Anai Erungin Andas Unausprechliche. <laughs> so, the unspeakable, un Yeah, literally unspeakable. <laughs> the unspeakable, yeah. So, approaching the unspeakable. Yeah. Uh, so, how do you explain uh, uh, German nationalism for us? I mean, very simply, this is a very simple question for, you know, <laughs> because, because we are, we are, <laughs> confronting the problem of nationalism in the whole world. And uh, uh, how would you explain German nationalism for us? And how would how we How many move? days for, <laughs> you would need days to talk about this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe I can um, try to narrow that down um, yeah. a little bit if I take the perspective of India which is uh, a topic which I have been discussing a lot with Tirta in uh, the last yeah. weeks and months. So now I will be happy just to concentrate on that and give you a brief overview. Um, yes, excellent. So, um, so where the to German, start? So, yeah, uh, you could start, uh, I, I might rephrase the question for you. So how are, the Germans looking at Indian philosophy, Indian religions in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. This makes it a little bit easier. Um, 
So um, it is in fact related to the first uh, part of the question because I argued that uh, in the study of um, foreign and non-European culture, um, it was a necessary uh, moment in the creation of the, uh, a German national identity. And um, because as you all know, also Germany is a belated, let's say nation. So Germany as we know it, as let's say German state exists from 1870. So, and everything what was before um, is in fact only a unity of language and not a, not a politi political unity. So, um, so the, this question is somehow thorny, um, mostly for Germans themselves to define who they are. Um, in fact, there are two main, um, let's say main pillars on which um, German self-knowledge is based on. And the one is language, which seems rather um, comprehensible. And the second one is religion. And, um, and here the problem starts because Germany is not um, 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 a homogenous religious um, country, but it is mostly, I'd say, half-half divided between um, um, Protestants and Catholics. So the whole um, process of reformation and counter-reformation um, took a very long and painful way um, to establish a kind of a um, equilibrium between different religious um, de um, denominations. And so a lot of the um, discussions which were going around um, who are we and where are our ancestors, where are our roots can be somehow boiled down to two basic ideas. And the first one is that the Greeks hail from the, uh, the sorry, Germans hail from the Greeks. So this way I had explored in my studies um, 20 years, the last, yeah, 20 years. And then um, there's another idea, which is a kind of a counter narrative to this idea that the Germans, uh, at least culturally, but also racially hail from the Greeks. It's the other one is that they come from the Indians. And this might now sound um, somehow funny maybe to you, but in uh, let's say 100 80 years ago, this was a serious discussion if um, where the peculiarity of German culture vis-a-vis um, -vis to the French could be explained. And one of the um, main, let's say, solutions for this thing was that Germans um, tried to explore India not as a, let's say, as, as a colony, um, as a real colony, but in Germany we speak about a colonialism of second degree. So it's a kind of a derived colonialism, which is not eager about conquering land, but Germans prefer to conquer, let's say, heaven. So they set on studying the Hebrew Bible on the one side, and on the other side also, they were very keen on exploring the incoming new um, texts um, from Asia and mostly from India. So, um, so uh, this is why this um, whole development is very much connected to colonialism, even if German soldiers didn't set any feet into the subcontinent um, or it, uh, only in um, a very uh, marginal uh, yes. way. In, mm. the South in, in South India and, you know, yes. in a very marginal way, yes. No, so compared to British and the French and the Portuguese, um, mm. German um, presence in India itself was negligible. But in Germany, so um, the knowledge production about India was strongly connected to an emerging German nation. So maybe I can 
make yes. this small stop and yeah. breathe, and then you yeah. can make your next yes. question. Yes, uh, this, is, this is very interesting. And, you know, Max Muller, you know, comes in and complicates issues further, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the one hand, uh, Max Muller uh, initiates this whole concept of the the Aryan the Aryan religions the Aryas and uh, the the religion of uh, the Aryas the Aryans was therefore appropriated by German nationalism uh, you know to put it in in more straightforward terms you know for our understanding and the concept of Arianism was a key factor in the uh, in the culture in the cultural appropriations of the National Socialists, for example, after the First World War. Uh, uh, even I've, I guess even from uh, the history of the Weimar Republic, there are already these uh, nationalist socialist rumblings and you know, it comes to solidify in the 1930s. So uh, I, the question I would pose for you here, so for everybody to understand is then since the idea of the Aryan race was so important, uh, how were the German nationalists socialists looking at Indian culture in the 1930s. Could you give us an example? Would you like to explain to us with the help of an example or or at an, or with an example from even before uh, the national socialists actually came to power? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. This is um, a very good idea maybe to choose an example because by this I can also present some of my recent work, which I'm doing in this moment. Um, so just to, to frame it briefly, um, in fact, the, um, I mean, we are, we are talking about now a gap of 100 years between, uh, let's say, Herder and his um, first ideas on um, the literature of the Indians, and then we have the whole story of, uh, yes, of course, Schopenhauer, for example, and the whole Schopenhauer reception. We have Max Müller, who in Germany, interestingly enough, is not seen as a German scholar, but because he was um, teaching in Britain, um, he's kind of curbed uh, in the German narrative of um, academia. Um, maybe for this reason, maybe also for one reason, which is, um, forgotten in many handbooks is that actually he was the one who um, who found that you know the dis differentiation um, between religion um, similarly to languages so it was back then that um, the um, the idea of two language families mainly the Semitic languages and the Indo-European languages um, was um, projected also on religion. And this, um, of course, opened a, um, a really uh, tragical gap, let's say, for German history between alleged Aryan religions and uh, Semitic religions. So this is a long story. Um, next, um, I would briefly make a stop um, on one figure which is um, very important for the later development, which is the editor of Schopenhauer's works and Indologist Paul Deussen, because in my opinion, just to put it very briefly, he invented Indian religion for the Germans and also for the Indians. We can discuss that later on. And um, founded these ideas that, um, maybe we're not, um, let's say, part of the general German culture in itself, but it was a very strong marginal movement. Um, they were 
it's part of a counter narrative to modernity. So this group of persons around Paul Deussen, um, they were uh, very engaged in trying to make the world better and save it mostly from materialism and modernity. And um, they all have showed a very strong leaning towards India. And here we can maybe we can bridge it. It's a little bit problematic because there is the first world war who just um, shook all Europe and changed a lot of things. But this idea that with um, the wisdom of the Indians, there is a, a kind of a salvation from the problems of modernity. This is persists and it's taken up um, in parts at least in national socialist ideas. So, and if I may, I would like to show you just briefly, um, I will see if I can share my screen. No, I cannot share my screen. Maybe I can ask I will, to... I will have to ask uh, uh, the, the technology personnel here to allow Dr. Schwader to share screen for us. Uh, Just for Akosha. a few minutes. Yes. Akosha, would you be able to allow Dr. Schwader to share screen for us? He just has to make her to a co-host. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Akashak, uh, please help us. You go to the list of participants. Please help us. Okay. Ah, yes. no, I, okay. I think uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Klaas is the most interested in the discourse we are having here. Okay, yeah. yeah. So we are very Yeah, pleased. we will come back to Dr. Klaas. Yes, Dr. Schroeder, go ahead, please. So now I think you can see my screen. This is um, the website of my project, which I'm working on. It's called the Menaka Archive. And to put it briefly, this is a digital archive on the material I have been collecting together with my colleagues on a tour, which um, the Indian dancer from Kolkata um, Madame Menaka, AKA Leila Royce, okay. Um, she toured with her um, dancers and musicians through Germany and the whole Europe and basically also the whole world. So we're discovering um, constantly new um, performances which they gave. And um, so if you are curious, uh, you can uh, have a look. Dr. Schmadida, Leila Roy, Leila Roy was, uh, her father was, uh, from Bengal, yes, and her and her mother was. Could you kindly British. British? Yeah, she was British, and okay. uh, Leila grew up also in Britain, where she mm -hmm. took her um, formation from, and she had her first experiences with classical ballet, and mm -hmm. she might also. Did, did, she study, did she study in uh, uh, in in the, in in Tagore in school Tagore school in India? At all? No, she studied in Britain. Okay. So and um, so when she came back to India, she mm -hmm. took up her music studies with the local um, artists from hereditary families, um, and she was taught mostly Kathak. And um, what we can say by now it's because um, the whole story of her has kind of fallen into oblivion oblivion, not only in Germany, but obviously also in India. So what we have collected is material which has never um, been put together before. So I'm really happy to present you also this. And um, so to put it briefly, they toured through Germany from 1936 to 1938. So this means in full Nazism and uh, only shortly before the Second World War and they were very well received. I can show you maybe one map, which is on, so I don't know if I can open. Mm. Yeah, it's difficult to open the, um, the website. Okay. So you might want to try yeah. it by yourself. So there okay. you will see a map when you open here this uh, locations button, mm -hmm. ah, here it comes. So, and you have all these, this is Germany, and mm -hmm. this is the map of the world. What we have discovered until now 
a couple of performances in South Asia and in Germany mostly, but also in the Netherlands and Switzerland and Austria and Italy. Okay. And um, this, this tour has been accompanied by a lot of press reviews, which are collected here. And you can read them also using Google Translate or so. We have roughly 1,000 articles right now. And um, one of my main, let's say, topics in my research is to try to understand what people saw when they saw the people dancing, because they are writing about um, their ideas on India. So it's um, basically these comments are mostly interesting um, not to discover actually what happened on stage, because this is lost. We do not know that. Um, in any way, the Germans didn't really understand what was going on, but they started to reflect on identities, on cultures, on um, how they could understand this culture. And they were um, thinking about if they were belonging to the same culture as they did, or if they were different. So this is this whole discourse, which even now is very uh, prominent and it's uh, known to us, um, this distinction between the us and the others to define the own um, um, identity. It started already in um, the 1930s and it found a very interesting mirror in these performances from those Indian artists. And this I find really fascinating because um, let's say it, what is really difficult to explain is why they were so popular because their art was actually, it was modern dance. It was not even classical Indian dance because there were a lot of creations which were new. And um, Menaka has worked not only with Anna Pavlova but also with her students and Russian choreographers. So the choreographies which they presented in Germany were actually fusions, similarly to those of Uday Shankar, for example which are much more known. So what they saw was um, a contemporary effort to renew Indian dance. But the Germans, they thought they saw classical Indian dance. So or what they perceived as to be, a, a, let's say, a homogenous Indian culture. And so this mirroring is uh, interesting and a little bit difficult to um, understand, but it shows how much Germany and India are somehow entangled and in their mutual perceptions. So, so, so your project would endorse uh, Edward Said's uh, insights into the nature of uh, into uh, about the construction of an Orientalist discourse. So, what this dance performance and the history of the performer. Uh, really shows us is uh, an Orientalist uh, perception of India uh, among the German nationalists, mm. right? Uh, yes and no. So, of course, um, what Edward said and Said said in his book opened mm -hmm. um, a very um, different view on. Um, European scholarship and European literary production on the East, yeah, on the right. Orient. And, but um, he also writes that there's a big lacuna in his work, which is um, basically um, related to German scholarship. And he leaves that out deliberately because he's not um, so familiar with it and he's concentrating on French and on um, English production. English, yeah. So um, there is, uh, in the last 30 years, of course, there has developed uh, an idea of what could German Orientalism be. And um, 
What I can see in this project with, with the material that I have collected on the Menaka ensemble is that there is, is a, let's say, there's a twofold German Orientalism. There's, of course, a very um, simplistic, maybe, um, idea of an exotic India, which is um, very, yes, it's, it's, it's on the one side, it's savage, on the other side, it's very innocent, and it has a lot of animals, and um, it's full of tigers and snakes and all that. So this is one predominant part of it, and it has found, found um, a lot of expression in movies, for example, or mm -hmm. in um, literature. But there's also this second image of India, which is, the, let's say, the spiritual India. And this is the India which has um, a um, this age-long and never changing tradition of spirituality, and which can teach something to Germans, because they have the idea that Indians have something what Germans have lost. So it is this. Um, um, it's a nostalgia. It's it's a nostalgia, in fact. Yes, but 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 uh, in, in a sense, uh, they couldn't be actually realistically connected, don't you think? Mm, because I don't know if I got your question. I um, mean, because because the German identity, even the German, uh, you know, the, what we call the folk folk, or the. Uh, uh, an yes. identity based on on their Christianity, on their Christianity, mm -hmm. on their Lutheran faith. Uh, uh, so the Lutheran faith, the uh, the early German Reformation, was no longer instrumental uh, in the history of nationalism in Germany. Is uh, am I am I right in saying that, or am I wrong? Or well, um, I would say that the Reformation is a very a central um, pillar of German identity. So um, when one, um, so in 1817, um, which was the, uh, I think 300 years of Luther's death. Yes, um, Luther, uh, the anniversary of- Anniversary, yeah, of yeah, the Reformation. It was, oh, it was a Reformation anniversary in 1817. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this was, um, uh, this uh, there took so it was the scene of the first let's say meeting of nationalist group at uh, the Wartburg which is near Erfurt this is a castle where Luther was imprisoned and where he allegedly translated um, the New Testament so this was one um, central part of recreating uh, a new German identity. So the next um, anniversary, 1917, of course, was in the middle of the First World War and only in 2017, so um, three and a half years ago, we had another <laughs> anniversary, okay. which oh, also was um, um, <laughs> very um, crucial it, because it, yeah, it, it was used also to reunite Eastern and Western part of Germany. And so I think it is still a very central part of um, national German identity. And at the same time, there is the, uh, there is a very critical Aryan, uh, a nostalgia for a kind of Aryan origin. So how do they coexist in the German nationalist imagination? Mm. Yeah, I think you already um, made that connection really clear. And um, let's say the um, so the the connection to an, a root which was way back in the past helped kind of uh, to stabilize um, an idea of Germany in a in a Europe where they um, obviously could not su succeed neither um, um, militarily nor 
um, economically, so I'm talking about Germany after 19th century. Um, yeah, so it, it was an idea to reconstruct something which was allegedly there. Uh, let us talk briefly about your interest in Indian dance and uh, you you yourself are a performer and you have been interested in uh, Indian dance forms like the Kathak and the Orissi. And um, uh, so how, how do you see the Indian, uh, re the reception of Indian art form in Germany today? Uh, has there been any change or to what kind of lineage uh, would the audience uh, still subscribe if they were looking at performance today? Oh, yeah. So first of all, I wouldn't say that I'm actually a practitioner of Indian dance. Maybe I'm, um, I'm trying to cultivate my interest by taking dance classes. It's already a long time, but I'm not, I'm not a very skilled performer. Um, in any case, I really appreciate classical Indian arts a lot and I like watching them and um, so I have so in the last 10 12 years I, I have always made attempts to introduce these art forms also um, in my region where this was really new um, so it's yeah, I think we have made some progress. We have invited um, musicians from India and dancers from India and um, they have performed here. And it, it's, of course, it's sometimes it's taking more time to educate the public to, to see things which they are not used to see or to, to hear some sounds which are not familiar to them. But I had really interesting and uh, positive feedback. So I think there's still a good um, audience for Indian art. So, yeah. So uh, we are already uh, running out of time and this, this discussion could go on, I guess, for hours. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> I would like to uh, enter into a, into a third phase. And uh, I would like quickly to have your views on to, to really learn from you about this other project that you are involved in besides your uh, archival uh, research on um, Menaka and the Indian dance uh, uh, tours, troba Indian troubadours from the 1930s. My question is about this uh, concept of critical religion. And I think, I personally think like because I have lived so long in India and I, I was born in India, I lived in India as a, as a common man uh, on the streets of an Indian city, the way I perceived colonialism was different from the, uh, I hesitate to say this, but it's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of closet post-colonialism. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the discourse of post-colonialism that emerges from uh, America uh, and to some extent in Europe, but not so much. Mm, because uh, the perceptions of uh, the imminent shadow of, uh, of imperialism in a very different form uh, is perceived in a different way by the man on the street in an Indian city or in an Indian village. It's, it's not the same thing as reading the problematics of post-colonialism in uh, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak or Homi Bhava, even though they address issues which are very relevant to the, you know, the post-colonial situation. But what I found interesting in your project on critical religion, uh, from the brief readings uh, on your website and, and from the kind of work, what I understand from the work you are doing. Critical religion, would you define critical religion for us and uh, how is it different from uh, post-colonialism? Mm, yeah, thank you very much for this question. Um, so how do I define critical religion? Well, um, 
maybe I share some presumptions of um, post-colonial studies um, in, in a way that in, um, so when I'm looking at religion as an uh, research field, um, I'm basically trying um, to, to make all those entanglements, which I have been explaining um, to you, and thank you for listening to that so patiently, um, as a, um, things that all contribute to the role of religion in society. So I don't think that religion is something which exists in itself, but um, it is a space um, where um, discourses of um, power are also um, defined. So um, if we talk about um, religion as something which is related to identity or something and define what is our and what is the others, then I think a um, lot of ideas we have in common with uh, post-colonial studies, even though, of course, this is not a um, unitary idea, but it's, it's a it's a branch of studies which is applied to very different fields and um, it goes right now from from literature to um, political studies and it's mostly about what I think is would be important at least in in Germany is to make um, relationships visible with the external or globalized world because um, German discourses tend very much to nest on themselves and um, develop um, an alleged uh, original thing, which of course is not. So if we look at um, how um, Indian culture has been incorporated into German philosophy, for example, or has been reinvented through German religion, then it just becomes visible that um, it's so we cannot talk about something which is what is German religion or something like that. And this is my concept of this critique is to, to look and to make visible these entanglements yeah. which are there. I, I mean, uh, a, a very interesting uh, and appealing aspect of uh, the phrase critical religion is uh, the fact that uh, mm, people in their in, the, in their collective identities have not, not really been able to divest themselves from a religious identity. In some way or the other, they belong to a, a religious base and uh, everywhere in the world. And they are, and it is, impo and it is important to look at uh, religion in a critical way. I mean, uh, the, the, the idea of religion in India and uh, religion is perhaps the most uh, uh, important uh, export item in India, but there, there is room for a, a lot of critical reflection on the Indian religions and what it means to be a Hindu in India, what, what it means to be a Muslim in, in, in Pakistan, for example, you know, and uh, uh, unless we, unless we di divest ourselves from these stereotypes, uh, we cannot really start to think of uh, a different kind of world. I think uh, we have already reached the limits of the time that was allotted for this talk. This has been a most wonderful, wonderful uh, exposure for all of us here, especially from uh, our participants here in South Asia and in other parts of the world we have learned uh, of very interesting um, developments in the history of arts and performances in Germany. And uh, uh, German scholars uh, continue to inspire us from what I see, from what we gather from this <laughs> interview with uh, Dr. Schwader. Um, it's wonderful, and I, I, I only uh, wish, I hope that there will be many instances of exchange of ideas between 
the German Academy and the Indian Academy and and uh, Rupkata will be more than happy to uh, offer a platform for these discussions and uh, for these new kinds of critical inquiries. So I would really like to conclude there uh, with, uh, and, and I couldn't thank enough uh, Professor Isabella Schwader for her presence uh, here tonight on Republic Day in India. Uh, India became a secular republic on the 26th of January. And so in a way we chose this date so we could have this interesting discussion on a, on a national holiday. And I would like to hand over to uh, Dr. Satpati for uh, the question session, which is um, which should be uh, limited to uh, five to ten minutes. But I'm sure um, many of you would be having a lot of questions. But we will keep our questions brief. And uh, Dr. Satpati, if you would uh, do the honors for the question session. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Professor Tita. Uh, actually, uh, I think uh, we have uh, Dr. Sena with us, and uh, she'll be taking over as a moderator for the session of question session. So uh, she's a PhD from Bits Pilani and a UGC fellow, and uh, she has her MPhil from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, so uh, may I hand over uh, to Dr. Sinha to kindly take over the question session? Thank you, Dr. Swam Prabha. And good evening, everyone. I speak from the desert state of Rajasthan, the land of Rajput chivalry and colorful Kalbelia dancers. What uh, Dr. Satpathi did not uh, inform you about is I'm part of Team Roop Katha, and we would love to have you all here in Pilani, Bits Pilani for yet another session as and when feasible. You're welcome to Rajasthan. And now we are indeed privileged to hear the extremely engaging and thought provoking words of Dr. Isabella Schwaderer, lecturer of religious studies at the University of Kiel. And of course, Dr. Tirtha Prasad Mukhopadhyay, professor, University of Guanajuato. Gwen Nago to, I would uh, uh, say University of Mexico. The complexity of multi-layered concepts like Orientalism, critical religion and music was made simple by their expert command on the topic. And so we move on to the next phase now, dear attendees, the speakers are now ready to take your questions, which can either be asked directly or keyed in the chat box. In between, I have a question for Dr. Schwaderer. Are Orientalism and Occidentalism as ontologies and epistemologies connected to institutions of power? Of, of uh, institutions of power, right? Power, yeah. Thank you very much. Professor, um, yeah, it's an interesting question. And I think I can answer that very briefly because there are probably um, scholars who are much more proficient in this field than me. And yes, I, I'm quite convinced that they are connected to institutions of power, which um, for example, like universities or schools and um, they shape a um, a certain view of the world which um, keeps certain power connections alive. So in this sense, I would say, yes, definitely. Uh, one more question from my side for you, uh, doctor. Mm, is religion a limiting concept or does it liberate? Uh, yes, this is almost a philosophical question, and I could probably go on for uh, 30 minutes in a row, but I'm sparing this. <laughs> if um, Yes, I would say from, from my personal 
point of view, I would say that religion is not really a concept. So it depends on um, on um, on the subject how you um, establish religion for yourself or how it is thought if it can be limiting or um, liberating. It's probably both. And um, if we look so. There are so many ways to um, celebrate religiosity um, in art, in philosophy, or even in mutual encounters like this one, which we are enjoying here so much. So that it, um, I think there is enough space in religion and generally in German, uh, not German, but human relationships. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. And since I don't see another question coming. Oh, I see a couple. So yes, Dr. Dr. Kasten, Dr. Good Kasten. evening. Good evening. Oh, yes. Yeah. Did you hear Dr. Me, me? Dr. Klassen had uh, his uh, hands raised uh, in the, yeah. So we can go to, uh, don't you think, uh, Dr. Seema, uh, we can go to Dr. Klassen, please, Dr. Sir, please. Thank you so much. Um, this is a very, very interesting topic. And um, I don't know we will, whether we will ever be able to figure that out altogether, Orientalism, Occidentalism, the role of religion. But one thing is, I think, for certain, that is sort of both a comment and a question, how much the other has always being attractive for the self. And we can be certain that India has been very attractive, very to Western Europe, as Dr. Schwar, as you pointed it out. I just would like to uh, maybe alert you to the maybe most important source, Hermann Hesse, who was deeply influenced by Indian culture. He wrote many of his books, short stories and novels in a way, influenced by India. So during the 1950s and 60s, I think India played a huge role in the Western world as an alternative to Western capitalism. Um, I don't know, Dr. Schwader, whether you would like to respond to that. It's not really a question. It's just sort of an addition to what you have observed. And then, of course, you could also talk extensively about the German romantics who were also deeply influenced by India. So that's a long and very interesting complex phenomenon. Indeed, thank you, Professor Klaas. And this is um, a really phenomenal addition to what I was trying to explain. And you are so right that there is a lot of um, many more things to be said about that. So um, the fascination for India, it's it's difficult to, to think about when it even started because already the ancient Greeks were fascinated by India and their philosophical concepts mm -hmm. or what they perceived to be their philosophy or religion or whatever. There is some merging between those fields um, always. So um, India has been a field also for, uh, and also I appreciated the idea that you introduced that India was um, um, an, opportunity to escape from um, the dire realities of um, modernity and um, generally of life. So it is a, it's a fantasy and it's, uh, there's behind also a mystical love and attraction. So it has, of course, this inter relationship um, in itself also many, um, let's say spiritual traits and this is, of course, also very, um, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, I feel very comfortable <laughs> working in this field also because um, I, I can see a lot um, about my, my own self in that. So in, in the thinkers like Hermann Hesse or all the um, unknown art lovers um, in the, ending of the 19th century who um, admired the Bayadeers, the so-called Indian temple dancers on European ballet stages and 
Devadasi. Um, also in paintings and Devadasi, yeah, or what <laughs> they thought what Devadasi's were. So, um, yeah, I would, um, I would like to see it as a never-ending love story, maybe, than as a story of conflicts. Yeah, so maybe here is where the twain meets. And mm. I see a question uh, from Lalita Joseph, who asks, exceptionalism practiced by religions has resulted in the creation of the other, often limiting people from appreciating the diversity what is your take on it? Yeah, um, I totally agree. <laughs> um, I agree, but this is only one side, as I said. So, um, so it is, yes, uh, as we discussed before, it's, it's a limitation, but it also adds an inspiration. So um, yeah, maybe we can just leave it like this so yeah, that listen. it has different sides. Yes. I, I'm, uh, Dr. Sima, I also see questions many hands raised. Uh, I would really love to listen to the question from Dr. Abdul Haq uh, from Pakistan, Dr. Twahira Bhatt. Uh, I guess she's uh, uh, from the Emirates, if I'm not mistaken. Saudi Arabia. Ah, Saudi yes, Arabia. Yes, Saudi Arabia. Okay, please give us a second. So we'll, we, we can take all the questions together and then maybe Dr. Shwadara might respond to them so we can keep maintain our time limits. Yes, Dr. Uh, uh, let us uh, continue with our question, question session uh, because mm -hmm. it will uh, make uh, us enriched uh, in a way that uh, uh, just uh, uh, we have queries. So yeah. these queries uh, need to be solved uh, in that way. Okay, so uh, I, yes, I, I would like to uh, encourage uh, the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the participants to put their questions and let the sessions continue. Thank you, Tarun. Uh, <laughs> okay, so Dr. Sima, if you would invite the questions and uh, we can continue for a, a little more time, uh, except that I have to attend to some some very important uh, work. I'm submitting my report. I have to protect my job. So <laughs> just, you know, just on a lighter way, but yes. yes, please. Okay, I think, uh, thank you very much. My question is uh, directly uh, about the, the main topic uh, about this music and this ballad. So my question is like, uh, who are these people who wrote these 1000 press briefings? Like who are these, like these, are these the journalists? Are these like the scholars and like uh, number one? And number two is like, I have just brief three questions. Number two is what they were like, uh, uh, you, you mentioned something, but like anything interesting, like they were writing, what they were writing uh, in that, like particularly if there is something interesting. And the uh, other thing is how the Indian press at the time was like reflecting on that, like talking about like then or later about these tours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your question. I will try to be brief. So um, who were the um, authors of the, they were, uh, it's difficult to say because usually they are not signed. So they were journalists working for newspapers. So there are no names. Um, in some case they have a signature. Then usually they were, musical specialists. So they were directors of local music schools or generally um, learned people on music theory who were writing on that. So there's, I would say, two dozen of articles from renowned musicians or, or music, musicologists mostly. And we have also um, found, let's say, a handful of um, scholarly articles okay. in um, music journals of that time relating to this topic. And yeah, what about the Indian press? So this, um, this is a new field that we are opening and um, we are working on um, putting that uh, material also online because it's available only since one year or so. Um, the Bombay Chronicle is um, now digitized and um, 
it seems that there are a lot of articles. So stay tuned, have a look at the website. From time to time, we will um, put things online slowly. Um, yeah, so there's Thank you. still a Thank lot you. going on. Thank you. I can see Dr. Priyanka Tripathi has a question. Ma'am, you may proceed. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shwadrar, for that wonderful talk. I think uh, partly uh, Professor Huck uh, asked my question, uh, but I will just uh, kind of uh, uh, I kind of have a rejoinder to that. So I wanted to know, uh, considering that in the colonial times, obscenity and press regulation both came into picture. So how did the discourse of uh, the uh, the literature, the musical that you talk about, how did it change? I mean, do you see a kind of shift with these kind of uh, colonial, uh, uh, you know, regulations coming in? Was there a change? Uh, is there that kind of a study available? So, I mean, just curious to know about that. Uh, yeah, not yet. So, um, I, I really this was a discovery which is maybe two weeks old that I saw, oh my God, this, um, the whole uh, issues of the Bombay Chronicle are digitized and so many other Indian newspapers, which were not at all available to me. So, um, and um, maybe I'm, I'm also not the right person to write this. Maybe it would be your um, topic to write on <laughs> and to look at these articles. I would be really delighted to, to read what you think, what is your perception of these texts then? Yeah, that is why I became like slightly curious because uh, uh, quite, uh, I mean, Indian literature for that matter changed its discourse completely when these, uh, you know, acts came into being. So uh, that is the whole, and, and, and that goes also to the musicals. Uh, yeah. All kinds of uh, art and literature forms that were reflection of society in a way. So yeah, thank you so much. I, I maybe, maybe I'll take it up later sometime with you. I'll follow your work and maybe then. Uh, let's yeah, see. I would be delighted. Thank you so much. Yeah, just to follow up, that yeah, like, uh, for example, we see the exhibition in Chicago or in American cities where the Indians, Africans are coming, there is a human show. Maybe like this is something connected with that like broader kind of the argument. A lot yeah. of people talk about that in anthropology or orientalism. So maybe okay. later on we can discuss about this. Yeah, sure, things. sure, Professor Hug. Thank you. The next question comes from Dr. Tawhida Bhatt. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is Tawhida Bhatt from Saudi Arabia. My question is like, in order to explore the contemporary issues in literature or different cultures, we all know about Orientalism, Occidentalism, colonialism. We know about all this, but what will be the new or contemporary issues that we can find in between the or uh, by talking about Indian literature, German literature, or Arabian literature? What will be the new or the key concepts that we can find? Hmm. Yeah, thank you. This is a really interesting question. And I'm, I, I think I will not be able to answer this um, because it's a very vast question. So maybe I can give that question also back to you. Do you have an idea what could those general questions be? Because I think it is something which has to be studied um, together. Um, like I don't what will be some key concepts? What will be some yeah. key concepts that we will learn for future or we can explore for future? What will be that key concepts? Yeah, maybe. Can I take that question? Relationship. Please? Yeah. So, yeah. From I would my suggest relationships or interdependence. That would be uh, a nice starting point, uh, and to go away from, um, yeah, to to singular perspective. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Doctor Bhatt, I would just like to add to what uh, uh, the speaker has uh, told us now. Taking example from Hinduism for that matter, uh, mm. it's a living tradition. The malleability that is Hinduism is, is uh, something that uh, Germany and India together experience. So ultimately it's one culture learning from another so that we can all come on the same platform. That is the take okay. up. Okay, that means we can explore on the basis of religion 
or we can compare like uh, I can compare Arabic religion, Indian religion, and German religion together. It definitely okay. uh, is, is a, it will be a new it will be I, a new concept. I think the take from this uh, this uh, talk by Dr. Schwaderer is to consider more of a critical religion uh, in this respect. Yeah, critical religion. We can make a critical analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Albert Klassen, I see a hand raised. Would you like to pose, pose a question? Uh, no. doc, Dr. Klassen has already spoken. I, I guess there are, yeah, there are questions from uh, Dr. Ernst Kadochniko, uh, who is Dr. Schwaderer's colleague, and also Noel Morat Moratilla. Uh, I'm not sure from where Dr. Moratilla is coming, but... From the Philippines, sir. He's from the uh, okay. uh, sure. Philippines. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, would you like to... Yeah. Continue. Please. He is also an oil for He is a regular contributor of Rup Kotha. Okay, <laughs> Professor. Okay. Okay. Please go ahead. Yeah, Pragati, would you uh, ask yeah. your question? Good evening, Madam. Okay. Good evening, Professor Dr. Swadhidhar. I am Pragati Dash from India, and good evening, everyone, all the professors and the participants as well. I am in charge of academic relations and research in Rupkatha. I have just a basic question as well uh, for, from all the boarding scholars from India. Madam, if uh, you uh, if uh, you know or if you want to share officially that if there is any kind of official procedures uh, we came to know about that for who is the boarding scholars, they can apply uh, to research in Germany or any interdisciplinary research between Germany and India. It will be very helpful to us. And after this session, much of the Indian researchers, they will be interested in this field. So this is a basic question from me as a boarding scholar. I hope that I'll get some uh, helpful answer. That's it. Yeah, thank you. Of course, I think um, basically all German universities have um, foreign or, or let's say an international relation office and their you can find the links on the website of every university where they explain the procedures and how it works. If it's not stated, uh, you know, detailed, then of course you can write there. And another source which I can um, um, uh, name is the DAAD. This is the, um, yeah, the, the, the state, um, connection, let's say it's the German exchange service. And um, there you find a lot of information and a list of all institutions that uh, also give scholarships to um, students from abroad. So um, I just write it quickly in the chat. Um, yeah. So just in case you didn't see. Um, yeah, how it's spelled. Just one second. So this is a D day A D. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there's an interesting question from yeah. Noel. Yeah. Yeah. Notwithstanding German Orientalist fantasy about India, how was German ultra nationalism complicit in British colonialism of the subcontinent, colonization of the subcontinent? Mm. Thank you very much. This is an intricate question. I'm not actually a historian to respond um, deeply on that. Um, what I know is that, um, well, one example, for example, for of the um, relationship of Germany with British colonialism is that um, the Nazis tried to um, fire the ideas of independence in India. And so um, they invi invited, for example, Subhash Chandra Bose to Berlin where he lived and um, also was very active. So, and, um, but basically um, there is no common line, let's say. There's a lot of um, criticism of British colonialism in India, but of course it was on 
their own behalf because they wanted to have their share of the cake. So um, yeah, maybe we can, we can leave that here because this is a question really that exceeds my knowledge by far. <laughs> Well, that was a very interesting explanation, ma'am. Thank you so much. Here is a question from Ernest who says, is the whole love story not only in the Orientalist modern epoch, but also in the postmodern post-colonial era, including the international community of the post-colonial colonial studies themselves, not a means to calm the consequences, consciousness, and so a means to dominate India? Um... Is the whole love story of Orientalism a means to calm the consciousness and a means to dominate India is the question. Mm, it's Dr. Yeah. Karat to make, make it yes, a little you can uh, yeah. precise. Uh, I mean, as, uh, even the uh, international community of the post-colonial studies themselves, uh, it is a community dominated by the Western, by the Anglo-Saxon uh, university system. Uh, because of the uh, of the history of the universities uh, in the in, in many 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 countries which have been colonized, and uh, I, I mean the colonial powers or the university landscapes in them uh, are still engaged in, in the post-colonial uh, discussion. Is uh, is uh, this discussion not a means to calm down the consciousness? Uh, e even uh, the, uh, the Marxist or leftist uh, domination uh, in the USA in some uh, intervals of, of the time. Uh, is it not a means to uh, calm down the con uh, consciousness and to make on in dominating India or the other countries which are, uh, which are dominated by the West? <laughs> So, yes, uh, I can, uh, if you allow me, Dr. Shwadra, to, uh, to say if, just a few words there. This is, a, this is a very relevant question. And what we are witnessing is also uh, uh, anglophonization, uh, if you might call it, of the Indian Academy. And uh, uh, if you look at the real logistics, the internet, is dominated by an Anglophone discourse. The industry is connected to English language articulation. The, the, the whole uh, network of globalization is dominated by, uh, from an Anglo-Saxon, Anglo Anglo, Anglophone position, a, even a Eurocentric position. I think this is a very relevant question. And there might be critiques of critiques, you know, uh, Critics, critiques within critiques, uh, and uh, in a never-ending regression of criticism, uh, in just in order to keep ourselves free from any kind of institutional allegiance. I think I'm not sure if that is a response, an adequate response to your concerns. There's another interesting question from Amna Tariq. Do you believe that there is any term? such as homo-religious. Where do you see religion after 100 years? Well, I'm, I'm not a prophet, so I, I would just avoid to respond the second part of the question. The first part sounds really interesting, but maybe you could um, develop a little bit on what you mean by homo-religious, Mr. Tariq. So I, I'm not sure if I got um, the real meaning. Maybe he means the religion of humanity, yeah, the, the one proto-religion. Hmm. Is Tariq yeah, here well, to I explain? Can only guess, yes, so I would, it would be Amna really nice. here to explain. Amna? Yeah, what Amna writes is homo religious means all religions started from one major religion. That's the explanation she is putting in chat box. Uh, okay, I see. 
Yeah, I mean, thank you for um, mentioning this. I mean, all German um, romantics would just uh, be excited <laughs> to hear that um, 200 years later, it's exactly their idea of our religion um, hailing from one um, original religion. Yeah, this. Um, I mean, diver diversity or a common uh, humanity, yes. I think uh, we are now really running out of time. Interesting. With Dr. Schwader, I have to leave, I'm sorry. And even Dr. Schwader, we have been occupying her for a long uh, period of time now. So uh, if Dr. Pra Prabha, just uh, please, uh, if you deliver the vote of thanks, uh, we would just uh, like to conclude this talk for uh, all of us here today. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Tita, and uh, my heartfelt thanks for Professor Schroeder uh, for such an enlightening and, uh, you know, everybody was so excited to talk to you, I think, and as you join uh, us in Rupkatha, so obviously we'll take this forward. And absolutely, Tarun very rightly said, Rupkatha is a very big umbrella, so it's not confined to uh, very few people. So, and uh, they have a uh, very broad, uh, what do I say, uh, knowledge base, except uh, and as well as a heart. Uh, so where, you know, they can uh, be accommodate uh, many into us. And so uh, absolutely, and that's really great. And thank you so much, Prof uh, Professor Tirtha Prasad Mukhavadhyay for such an opportunity. So uh, we are also your disciples, ardent disciples, and would always look forward for your guidance and supervision. Uh, and of course, all the guests who have joined us, and I, I would say, as Deetada always tells us, that we are a family. There is nobody who is outside Rupkatha. So when uh, whoever joins us, uh, even as an attend, uh, as a participant in the discussions, is a part of us. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Pragati. And uh, so we have some young scholars as Pragati, the uh, Thakurdas, and of course we have a little master, Akashak Bose. Uh, who takes care of all this uh, technological, uh, you know, uh, uh, issues that uh, are there for uh, organizing such kind of uh, webinars. So it was really great having you all. So have a great evening and uh, thank you so much. <laughs>